Ako po si Neri Colmenares, uh, chairman po ng Makabayan uh, Coalition. Uh, tumatakbo pong senador sa 2019, uh, human rights lawyer at uh, isang aktivista na lumalaban para sa prinsipyo at sa kapakanan ng sambayan ng Pilipino. I was the author of the anti-torture law and the anti-enforced disappearance law and the law that uh, recognizes and compensates victims of martial law. Uh, other than that, syempre, yung isa sa major na achievement siguro na masabi ko, naging diskurso ang national discourse, ang human rights at extrajudicial killings ng panahon ni Gloria Arroyo dahil din sa pagpursigi namin ng mga investigasyon sa extrajudicial killing. Well, yung fighter ng bayan was not an invention to fit the person, but uh, actually, I was the person long before they named me fighter ng bayan. Sa mahaba kong termino, sa tatlong termino ako sa kongreso. Sa tatlong termino ko sa kongreso, uh, pinakita ko naman na pag ang tingin ko ay para sa mamamayan, ito naglaban ko yon. Uh, fighter ako dahil I don't really back down if I think I'm right. Uh, yan naman ang sigurong advantage ko from other you know, members of Congress and other senatorial candidates. Kasi may mga consideration sila sa mga bagay-bagay. Uh, for example, uh, contractualization. Sometimes other candidates would consider na pag uh, nilabanan ko ang contractualization, I may not get the support of the big business. No? Uh, ako naman, of course, I'd like to get the support of any of anybody and everybody, including business. Um, gusto ko namang manalo eh. Uh, pero dahil fighter ng bayan ako, mayangganan para sa akin ang pagnanais na manalo. Uh, there are certain principles I cannot compromise. Pagtama-tama, pag mali-mali. pinaka-immediate mataas na presyo. Uh, ano, bakit tumaas ang presyo? One of the main reasons bakit tumaas ang presyo dahil sa excise tax na pinataw ng train. Pag magdagdag ka ng tax sa mga inflationary products like gasolina or diesel, tatal, talagang tataas ang presyo ng bilihin. So, para sa akin, importante ang issue yan. In fact, meron kaming mga solusyon dyan. Meron na akong proposed solutions na dyan. Una, i-repeal mo yung excise tax ng train. Ang, pang, ang boto ng makabayan, no, sa train law. In fact, maraming kandidato ngayon na magsasabing against sila sa train, but only we in makabayan, not, 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 not only we, mali naman yun. Rephrase. Pero kami sa makabayan, we can look people straight in the eye and say, we voted no on the train law. In fact, we filed a petition in the Supreme Court to invalidate the excise tax of the train law because it was not approved by Congress with a quorum. So that's the first. The second solution is I filed this bill noon pa. Tanggalin ang bat sa kuryente, tubig at uh, langis. You know, these are inflationary products. Pag mag ka sa shampoo, eh, oh, okay lang siguro yun kasi pag hindi mo na ma-afford yung shampoo, hindi mag magperla ka o magugu ka. Pero itong sa kuryente, tubig at langis, grabe ang impact niyan sa bili. So, that's my solution to the issue of very, very high prices. Second, sa income naman side, dapat taasan ang sweldo ng manggagawa. May bill na kami sa Kongreso at hindi ito parang pinapangako lang kasi election. We have filed the bill. We have a track record to show that we have filed bills for the increase of wages of workers. Ano ang aming bill ngayon? 750 pesos per day minimum sa lahat ng mga gawa sa buong bansa. Pantayan, walang regionalization ng wages na mas mahal ang Metro Manila, mas mura lang doon sa Ilocos or sa Pangasinan or sa Visayas or sa Mindanao. And secondly, of course, isang batas na walang patumpik-tumpik na nag-abolish ng contractualization. Contractualization is something that many candidates and many politicians avoid because either the lobby of big business na huwag isulong yung pag-alis ng contractualization or these members of Congress themselves have a large company with 
contractual workers. Pero sa akin, yung solusyon talaga dyan, no, sa bill filed. We, I filed the bill when I was Congress, practically abolishing contractualization. The rule must be regular ang tenure ng mga manggagawa and uh, exception lang yung contractual. Ang nangyayari ngayon, baliktad eh. Contractual ang rule, exceptional na lang pag maging regular ka. Dapat matanggal yung very heinous na system na yan ng contractualization. Of course, sa pagdagdag ng sahod, may bill naman kami sa Kongreso, ang pinaka-minimum na sahod dapat ng government employees, uh, 16,000 pesos a month. Salary grade 1, ang 16,000 pesos, at ang salary grade 2, 3, and 4, tataas accordingly, depending on that, basta ang minimum 16,000 pesos. So that's the second solution that I'm offering. Third, Ano naman ang gagawin natin sa mga hindi naman gagawa? Paano mo naman ma-increase ang sahod nila hindi sila manggagawa? Who am I talking about here? These are the retired workers, whether government or private. So para sa akin, pagtaas ng pension is one. At may bill kami sa Kongreso na 5,000 pesos dapat ang pension ng lahat ng senior citizens sa buong bansa. Whether miyembro ka ng SSS o social pensioner ka, hindi ka miyembro ng SSS. So, Ang pinaka-importanting issue ngayon talaga dito ay ang kahirapan. At ang kahirapan na yan ay bunga ng mataas na presyo, mababang income, mababang sahod. So ang solusyon talaga dyan ay una, tanggalin ang mga excise tax, ang mga VAT sa petrolyo, kas, uh, kuryente at tubig. Pangalawa, tanggalin ang kontraktualisasyon at pagtaas ng sahod ng manggagawa maging sa gobyerno at maging sa pribado at pangatlo, pagdagdag ng pensyon. We've always been against Chacha, not because we're against constitutional reform. Ako hindi ako absolutist. I would welcome constitutional reform, but for the better, not for the worse. Ang nangyayari, in the GMA days, Chacha niya, we exposed it. Term extension ng habol ng Chacha ni Gloria Arroyo nung panahon niya. And unfortunately and very sadly, she's back in power and the and the Chacha she, she passed recently in the form of resolution about houses number 15. Ang laman nun, term extension na naman. At pangalawa, cancellation of election. At pangatlo, pagtanggal ng term limits. At pangapat, pagtanggal ng prohibition sa political dynasty. At panglima, pagbukas ng bansa sa transnational corporation further. At panganin, pagkat ng vice president doon sa uh, line of succession. Go lang tayo sa dali sa vice president. When Gloria Arroyo's RBH 15 said that the successor to the incumbent president, Rodrigo Duterte, in case he is removed from office or is incapacitated, is not the vice president but the Senate president and ultimately, of course, the Speaker of the House. Maraming lumaban dyan. Maraming nagsabing, bakit... Bakit tanggalan mo ng pwesto ang vice presidente? Eh, inilek nga ng tao yun para vice presidente. Speaker Gloria Arroyo promised to reinstate the original provision. Nung pinasa ang RBH 15, ay siguro ang mali ng marami, ng tiwala sila kay Gloria Arroyo, akala ni reinstate niya. Binasa ko kahapon ang RBH 15, and I just found out, she practically obliterated the office of the vice president. What does uh, Article 16, Section 4 of RBH 15 say? That in case of death, removal from office, or incapacity of the incumbent president, the vice president takes over or acts as president until a new president shall have been chosen, shall have been chosen and qualified. Ano ibig sabihin nun? Under the, under the Constitution, ang vice presidente ang maging presidente pag nawala ang presidente. Ito, acting president si Vice President Robredo until someone chooses the president who chooses the next president. Sino kongreso ang magpipili? O di si Gloria Arroyo na yung sunod nating presidente niyan pag ano nang mangyari? And that is a recipe for civil war. Bakit? naka Nag-assume na yung vice president ng, presi ng powers ng presidency. Tapos mayroon, isi-select sila na presidente na mag-replace sa kanya. Ang gulo yan dito. So that's one more reason why I would come forward and say 
Itong cha-cha na to, it's not all about the Filipino people. It's not about the benefit of the people. It's not about the development of the country. This cha-cha is another self-serving effort para magkaroon ng cancellation of election, para magkaroon ng term extension, para matanggal ang term limits, at mapanatili ang sarili nila sa poder. This cha-cha is not about people. It's about benefits for politicians like Gloria Arroyo and President Duterte. Ang first step talaga ng mamamayan dito is to not be lulled into complacency na ah, dead on arrival na sabi ng mga senador. There is still a chance. Now, I'll go to another point. This is the icing on the cake talaga. Under RBH 15, it is embedded a provision that will cancel the 2019 elections. Ano yon? Transitory provision. It says, the first election under this new constitution shall be on the second Monday of May 2022. Kaya nila ni railroad sa house ang Chacha. Kasi minamadali nila. Bakit? Kung ma-approve ang Chacha ng Senado at ma-ratify before May, kahit pa April ang plebisito, Simple lang ang plebisito. Papel lang yan, hindi yan automated. Isang question lang yan. Do you approve of the proposed constitution? Yes or no? Kayang-kayang amount ng pomilik yan anytime. You don't need a big budget for that. Pag na-approve ang cha-cha nila by March or even April of 2019, what happens to the 2019 election? It's cancelled. Why? Because the new constitution says that the first election is 2022. Kaya, sabi ko, this is a very palatable cha-cha now from senators down to the lowest councillor kasi makakancel ang 2019 election. And everybody in almost all of the incumbents would like the elections cancelled. So, there is still a chance for me. Bakit? Alam nyo, ang cha has always been very powerful. Lahat ng cha Always very powerful from the start. Whether it's the cha of the former presidents or even this cha under President Duterte. In the middle of this cha efforts, they lose team. Bakit? Nalaman kasi ng tao yung content. Ngayon, alam na ng tao yung content. Ang opposition ng tao will grow. That is why I still believe that there's a chance to stop Chacha. The only window we have now is from January 20 to February 2. That is the time when the Senate will convene. And all and the arena now is shifted to the Senate. Yan ang YCGMA dyan. She shifted the battle to the Senate. Ngayon, Senate ang mag-decide. The moment Senate approves RBH 15, wow. It will be a very difficult uh, campaign for the, those who, vote, who want to vote no. Because the government has the resources, the, the pro chacha people have the resources, and uh, the repressive political conditions do not allow for a free deliberation of chacha. We say, you cannot campaign like you're free to campaign. Takot yung tao eh. So for me, the arena is in the Senate. Dapat hindi po masasa Senado yan. Kasi the moment po masasa Senado, medyo difficult ang ratification campaign dahil sa overwhelming advantage ng pro cha forces in controlling the result of any plebiscite that will approve the, 20, the new uh, charter change. Yung martial law is ginagawa ng constitution as the last uh, resort kumbaga, ng isang gobyerno to defend itself from threats. Uh, yun na yung grabe na talaga ang threat na kailangan last resort, yung pinaka-extreme measure like martial law. Kaya ang martial law hindi siya basta-basta ini-impose kasi may impact yan sa human rights. May impact yan even sa economy. How, how can business thrive eh, martial law? There's no sense of uncertainty. Pero nagulat ako, in-impose nila ang martial law for no reason at all. During the oral arguments in the Supreme Court, the Solicitor General representing President Duterte said, wala naman kaming purpose sa martial law except psychological advantage. That is because 
Ilang beses ko na tinanong yun sa mga pro-chacha forces. Is there something you can do in martial law na hindi mo magawa pag walang martial law? I mean, Sambuanga siege. Do you remember 2013? The MNLF attacked Sambuanga. Nag-aerial bombing ba doon? Yes. May martial law ba doon? Wala. Pumasok na yung pangkidigera sa Sambuanga City. Nag-mortar uh, warfare na doon. May martial law ba? Wala. May checkpoints all over Mindanao noon. May martial law? Wala. Ang ibig ko lang sabihin, nag-aerial bombing, nag-house-to-house -house combat, nag-mortar, nag-pangkinigyera, lahat yung ginawa walang martial law. So, bakit nyo kailangan ng martial law ngayon? Walang masagot ang Solicitor General. Sabi niya, well, psychological na lang. Ay, that's very... That's a lousy argument. In fact, all things being equal, the moment the opposite lawyer says na ang martial law pala psychological lang, dapat dismiss na agad yung martial law sa Korte Suprema. Because the, the, the Constitution says you can only impose martial law if there's actual rebellion and public safety requires it. It didn't say for psychological impact you can impose martial law. It didn't say that. Kaya nga, medyo strange yung decision ng Korte Suprema allowing the President to impose martial law on the basis of psychological impact. At bakit nila ayaw aminin kung ano talaga ang gusto nila sa martial law? The first thing is, the only power that is granted to the government of President Duterte under martial law na hindi nila inaamin publicly is, take over of civilian positions. Because that's the essence of martial law. When the general takes over the governor of the province, when the colonel takes over the mayor of the city, hindi nila in-exercise ngayon yon. So why are you declaring martial law if the general is not even going to take over sa governor? Ah, para sa akin, pinapadama tayo dyan. Nilalal tayo into, oh, okay naman palang martial law ah. Pag ma-impose na yan nationwide, then that's the time these military men will begin to replace civilian authority because that's the essence of martial law. So am I for martial law? Of course not. Why should the military rule over the elected officials of the province or the city or the town? And there's even no actual, I mean, pub. wala nga silang rason. Psychological lang naman ang rason nila. So, I was really saddened na martial law was approved by the Supreme Court recently. President Duterte's policies, we realized too late, uh, are anti-poor. I'm not even talking of EJK here for now. I'm talking of economic policies. Ano, yung train law, bakit? Talagang birayan sa mahirap. Yung extrajudicial killings niya, talagang mahihirap talaga ang tatamaan yun. Hindi naman siya nagre-raid, hindi naman siya tutokhang sa Forbes Park eh. Doon siya sa tondo ng tutokhang at sa payatas eh. Yung uh, rule niya dati na lahat ng tambay hulihin, eh, mahirap yung binibira noon. Kasi yung mayaman sa mall naman ng tatambay, eh. hindi naman sa kanto-kanto eh. Yung kanyang policy na... na yung economic policies niya na inaallow yung mga mining firms etc kahit na publicly he's saying against sa mining may ay pag tatamaan mahirap para kanino yan sa mayaman yung train 2 niya train 2 is all about lowering the income tax of corporations iba i ang corporation pala ibabaan mo ng income tax pero yung mahirap i-impose mo yung excise tax sa gasolina sa crude so, really, exposed naman si President Duterte na anti-poor yung kanyang policies. Yung kahirapan lang dyan, because when he mouths pro-poor statements, syempre, maraming nadadala. Because he speaks differently. E, President Duterte speaks differently from all other politicians and presidential candidates. In fact, he speaks differently from all other presidents. But he asks the same, if not worse, than the other presidents. Traditional politician pa rin siya. He's a trampo who promises things, pero hindi niya naman tuto pa rin. So, in, in the end, siguro yun na lang ang ma, uh, dapat ma-expose sa taong bayan na akala ng natin makamahirap siya. 
Pero in the end, yung patakaran niya, ang tinatamaan at naghihirap lalo ay ang mga mahihirap. Um, that is not easy because he has all the, you know, the resources of the president, the media, and the, the, the trolls, and the internet. Eh, hindi ganun kadali. Pero ako, kaniwala naman talaga ako sa ano eh, na in the long run talaga, lalabas ang katotohanan. Kasi ang katotohanan, hindi mo yamang sagkaan by, by putting a dam sa isang malaking inog. Dar- darating ang panang nabubulwak ang katotohanan and uh, President Duterte will be exposed as the worst president the Philippines ever had. Pero may, I have a dream. I have a dream na kung pala rin ako makaupo sa Senado, sana magawa ko ito. Isang batas na naglilay down ng industrialization policy. Para sa akin, ang solusyon sa kahirapan ng Pilipinas is uh, two-pronged yan. Economics, genuine agrarian reform, and industrialization. Short agrarian reform. Walang bansa na umunlad sa buong mundo na may ganitong kalagay katulad sa atin na millions of pesos tiling millions of hectares of land, hundreds of thousands. Walang bansa na umunlad sa buong mundo na katulad ng ngayari sa atin na millions of pesos tiling hundreds of thousands of hectares of land owned by a landed few. Walang bansa na ganun. So dapat ang genuine agrarian reform, aangat ng seven ng kabuhayan ng 70% ng ating populasyon, yan ang daan papunta sa development. Second, industrialization. Anong industrialization? Simply put, ang industrialization, buhos kapital at suporta ang gobyerno sa lokal na negosyo at industriya. Yun ang solusyon niya. Yung foreign investor economic driven strategy ng gobyerno, been there than that na yan eh. Lahat ng, gobyer- lahat ng presidente mula kay Marcos ang ngayon President Duterte, when they go abroad, when they come back, sabihin nila, I brought with me 100 million dollars of investment, 1 billion dollars of investment, di ko trillion, trillion, trillion dollars na ina-invest ng sino-sino foreigners dito sa atin, umangat bang buhay natin? Hindi. Wala akong sinasabing hindi dapat mag, may foreign investor. Ang sinasabi ko, secondary yan. Ang primary engine of growth is national industrialization. Buhos ng support at kapital ang gobyerno sa lokal na negosyo at industriya. Why are we poor? I mean, there are many reasons why we're poor. There are corruption, dynasty, but in economics, why are we poor? We are poor because we do not produce what we need. We produce what other countries need. We produce the copra, the abaca, the sugar, the pineapple, the nyong for other countries. Who produces our needs? Sinong gagawa ng t-shirt na to? Sinong gagawa ng electric fan? Akala natin tayo gagawa ng electric fan, buksan mo yan. Yung makina niya galing abroad. Ang t-shirt, tingnan natin. Oh, made in China na lahat ito. Uh, kung mayaman-yaman ka, made made in UK, kay ukay Di ba? So, ngayon, bibenta ka ng nyog, bibili ka ng electric fan, lugi ka. Mas mura ang nyog sa electric fan eh. Bibenta ka ng asukal, bibili ka ng aircon. We need to industrialize. We need steel industry, manufacturing industry. Yan ang kailangan natin. Paano tayo unlad? Pako lang din natin ang produce. Akala natin yung perdible, tayong gumagawa niya. Hindi. Imported yan from China. Oh, yan ang susi. When thousands and thousands of factories sprout all over the country, yan ang tunay na empleyo. Ngayon ang empleyo, ngayon call center, laway, o kaya sales girl ka sa isang mall, servisyo. No, ang tunay na empleyo, at the end of the day, you produced an electric fan, you produced an aircon, you produced a car. Yun yung tunay na industry. Pag nag-sprout yung factories all over the country, siguro yung may-ari pa ng opisina o factory na magsasabi na sa mga workers, dito ka mag-apply sa akin, mas mahal sahod ko dito kaysa kabilang factory. Eh ngayon, isang factory, pausan kayo eh. Eh talaga ang contractual ka niyan, kasi sabihin ng may-ari, ayaw mo ng contractual, di umalis ka, may isang libo pang nakapila dyan. Yan ang solusyon sa ating unemployment. Simple lang ang industrialization. Gawa tayo ng asukal, ibenta natin sa ibang bansa ng mura, gawin niya ng tsokolate, ibenta sa atin ng mahal. Anong industrialization? Why don't we build a factory 
na tayo mismo ang gagawa ng ating asukal into tsokolate. Yun lang, tayo ang gagawa ng tsokolate. Bakit ibenta mo yun sa abroad? Gagawin nilang tsokolate ibenta sa'yo. So, yun yung dream ko talaga. If ever I become a senator, I will really push for national industrialization. Mga lokal na negosyo at industriya. Yun dapat ang, yun dapat ang encourage ng gobyerno. Ngayon, pag foreign investor ka, parang mas madali ka pa mag-apply ng business permit kaysa lokal ka na negosyante. Anong klaseng government policy yan? Dapat proteksyonan mo ang lokal mo na negosyo. So, sa akin, if we have genuine agrarian reform and we have genuine national industrialization, yan ang tunay ng trabaho. Lahat ng bansa na umunlad, nag-industrialize yan. Japan, China, US, England, ang pinakahuli nag-industrialize, South Korea. South Korea said about 15-20 years ago, sabi ng South Korea, we will industrialize. We will have a steel industry. Pag may steel industry na kami, gagawa na kami ng pako. Then later, gagawa kami ng electric fan, gagawa kami ng aircon, ultimately, gagawa kami ng kotse. Yung malalaking bansa like Japan, US, etc., sabi nila sa South Korea, don't industrialize. Kasi pag mag-industrialize ang South Korea, o Pilipinas for that matter, hindi na sila bibentahan ng nyug, copra, baka asukal. Wala na silang source ng raw materials. Pangalawa, wala na rin silang bibentahan ng air, aircon, electric fan, at kanilang mga kotse. Pero South Korea stood firm and said, no, we will industrialize because that's the only solution to the poverty of the South Korean people. So, what happened now? Obi, ang South Korea is far richer than the Philippines. We were supposed to be second to during the time of our grandfathers in the 1950s. Second daw tayo sa Japan in terms of economic development. Nang martial law si Marcos eh. Uh, after that, we were nasa dustbin na tayo ng listang. So, for me, that's, that's my dream sa Senate. No? Yes, definitely. Definitely. There is hope for us to to become a new Philippines, a developed Philippines, a Philippines which respect human rights. Uh, otherwise, I won't even be here. <laughs> Why are we even talking about this? Why am I even running for the Senate? Kung wala namang palang pag-asa. Sa mahabang panahon ko bilang aktivista at bilang advocate for human rights, advocate for peace, advocate for development, marami naman ang sasabi na Neri, You've been fighting the cause of the Filipino people for so many years. Don't you ever get tired? Of course, physically, siguro pa minsan you get tired. But no, in terms of fighting for the Filipino people, no. Why? For two very basic principles. The first is trust. Trust in the capacity of the Filipino people to change society. Trust in the capacity of the Filipino people to change their destiny. We are not condemned to eternal poverty. Kaya natin baguhin yun. Marcos was one of the most powerful dictators in the world, ng martial law. He was the executive, presidente siya. He issued laws and presidential decrees, kaya kongreso din siya. He issued warrants of arrest, search and seizure orders, kaya judiciary din siya. Lo and behold, one fateful day in February of 1986, the Filipino people stood up and said, This is enough! And one of the most powerful dictators in the world beat the dust in 1986. So do I trust the capacity of the Filipino people to change society, reform the Philippines for the better? Yes. Now, the moment you have trust, then inevitably you have hope. Why? <laughs> Kung tingin mo kaya ng mamamayan na baguhin ang ating kahirapan, baguhin ang nangyayari sa ating bansa, may pag-asa ka. Kasi the moment na wala ka ng pag-asa, o hindi, huwag na tayong mag-usap ng mga issue dito. Siguro kung may capacity ka, mag-abroad ka na lang. Doon ka na lang kasi eh, wala nang pag-asa dyan sa Pilipinas. No, but we stay. We stay because we hope. And para sa akin, yun siguro ang pinaka-message natin sa young generation na do not ever lose the trust and the hope. Because a people who has lost confidence in itself 
in changing and reforming society is a people without hope. And for a people not to have hope, dictatorship will continue and reign forever and ever. But that's precisely why we keep on battling for the betterment of the country. Because I believe that the Filipino people have the capacity to change the society for a better and so that the next generation of Filipinos, the, our children, our children's children, will be able to live in a society that is respectful of human rights, a society that enhances the development of the people, and a society that has escaped from the clutches of poverty. Ito po si Neri Colmenares at ito po ang aking kwento. Now you know. Mm-hmm.